Welcome to five more minutes, useful videos in about five minutes that support the teaching and learning of all students. I'm your host, Shelly Moore. Today's episode is called Cheers for Peers. A big misunderstanding about inclusion is that inclusion is simply just students with disabilities sharing a general education class with students without disabilities. This is definitely an important first step, but it just isn't enough. Often when students with disabilities are enrolled in general education classrooms, they're still kind of off to the side working with an educational assistant. And although well-meaning, working one-on-one -on -one with an adult actually creates barriers to the benefits of inclusion. Many students, for example, end up feeling more isolated in their inclusive class than if they were in a self-contained or a segregated class. Parents of students with disabilities are also often told to advocate for one-on-one -on -one support because it's assumed that that's the only way their child can be successful in an inclusive classroom. But parents, it's just not true! Okay, so family advocacy is so important. And so parents and caregivers, I am talking to you right now. A great way to advocate for inclusion for your child is not to ask for one-on-one -on -one support. Instead, advocate for support for the whole community. That way the entire community can support your child, not just one EA. Okay, so what does this actually mean? This still means that we absolutely need educational assistance and other support adults in our classrooms. But their roles are really evolving away from providing one-on-one -on -one support and towards becoming a facilitator of interaction between students with and without disabilities so that they can support and learn from each other. Which brings me to one of the most underutilized resources in inclusive schools and classrooms, peers! Peers are a natural support in a classroom, and they can be authentic social and learning partners to students with disabilities in ways that are mutually beneficial. But there's two things we need to do to create this kind of partnership. Number one. We need to increase proximity. Simply look around. Are students sitting together? Are they taking the bus together? Are they coming in the front door of the schools together? Lunch together? Are they sharing recess time, break time, class time? If they are, great. If they're not, this is your first step. Increasing proximity is important because it leads to the next step. Number two, increasing participation. When students share space, they will also start to naturally participate in social interactions together. Sometimes it's assumed that these social interactions are the only benefit to inclusive classrooms, but it's absolutely not the only way that students can participate in a community. Participation in learning is another big benefit to inclusion, which can happen in many ways. Many of us are familiar with peer mentoring, where peers can support students with disabilities through learning activities. This kind of peer support is beneficial, but too much can create a power imbalance that rarely leads to friendship. And we don't just want peers replacing the roles of adults. Many current inclusive initiatives are looking at how students with and without disabilities can engage in balanced learning opportunities together. Some examples could include opportunities for all students to share learning supports, share learning goals, and share learning activities or tasks. The benefits of proximity and participation between students are vast and may include increased attendance, increased appreciation of diversity, personal growth, increased outcomes after school is finished, increased friendships, decreased stigma towards disability, increased access to grade level curriculum, increased advocacy, and so many more. And so parents and teachers, let's do this. Let's shift our advocacy efforts away from one-to-one -one staffing and instead let's advocate for children with and without disabilities to be in proximity to each other. Let's advocate for educational assistance and other adult staff to work with the whole class instead of just one student. Let's advocate for collaboration and planning time for classroom teachers, support teachers, and educational assistants to work together. How about advocacy for training for educational assistants so that they know how to facilitate take peer interactions and mentoring. Oh my goodness, we could also advocate for professional development so that teachers know how to implement universal design for learning strategies and other inclusive curricular design frameworks. 
We can even support peers to learn how to mentor, interact, and learn with and from a student with disability. There's just so many examples. But here's a really important thing about that list. If you look at those examples of advocacy, it's shifting the focus towards the efforts of a classroom community to be ready for a student, instead of what often happens, which is expecting a student with a disability to get ready for a community. It's a much more equitable approach that supports belonging, identity, and diversity for everyone. Thanks for watching this month's episode of Five More Minutes. Don't forget to like the video, give it a subscribe, maybe even share it with your friends. You can also stay tuned for the podcast coming out later this month that aligns with the big ideas from this video and can be found wherever you find your podcasts. I will see you next time and let's give a big cheer for peers.